Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Bad Batch introduced a new concept to Star Wars fans, with the creation of characters like Omega and Emery Carr. Upon first glance, they might seem like any other staff working for the Empire's various science divisions, but both Omega and Emery Carr share the same DNA, and not only with each other, but also with all of the other clone troopers. You see, Omega is an unaltered female clone of Jango Fett. And Emery Carr is also a FET clone, although we don't have more details about her beyond that. Now, initially, I thought that Omega was a one-off experiment, similar to the Bad Batch. A brilliant researcher like Nala Say is bound to have her own interests and curiosities. And so maybe Omega was just a personal project. But the presence of Emery Carr seems to indicate that there might have been a few other female clones produced, or perhaps even a larger batch for one reason or another. Today we'll be taking a look at the science of cloning, the fundamental differences between the sexes, and what advantages you would have creating female clones. And perhaps equally as important, the culture of the Kaminoans and how that shapes their decision-making process. Let's start off by talking about the Kaminoans' culture. The Sith could have went to a variety of different cloning corporations and outlets all across the galaxy. The Comites, for instance, perfected their own species through cloning, not so different from the Kaminoans. There are several large corporations that actually provided their services to the wider galaxy, like Sparti Creations and Arcanian Microtechnologies. But the Kaminoans offered a unique set of qualities to the Sith that no one else really could. See, once upon a time, the Kaminoans actually lived on land, but then the ice caps on their planet melted, which caused a massive flood, forcing the Kaminoans to go through some pretty drastic changes in order to survive. Kaminoans were faced with a stark choice. They could either call for help from the Republic and find themselves indebted to off-worlders, or they could attempt to rebuild their society above the waves and use genetic engineering to help their species better adapt to the new situations they faced. The Kaminoans decided to go their own way. They became a diamond forged in the most intense pressure. Many people called the Kaminoans xenophobic, but the reality is they don't harbor hatred or fear of outsiders so much as they just don't care about them, outside of what they can offer to Kamino. It's more classical arrogance or elitism than anything else, but the you know, Kaminoans did deserve to be a little bit arrogant. The Kaminoans, for whatever reason, were just highly focused on their own planet and their own research projects. They believed that everything they needed in the galaxy was already here for them. Perhaps this is just the residual effect of all the sacrifices and hardships they went through to survive that great flood many generations ago. You know, I've seen how trauma can really change multiple generations of, of a civilization or culture. The end result is that very few Kaminoans, especially before the Clone Wars started, ever left Kamino, and with the Kaminoans favoring self-sufficiency over expanding their connections with the wider galaxy, there's very little traffic leaving and coming to the system. And so, there's really no better place in the galaxy for the clone troopers to be manufactured, if you want it to be completely hidden, that is. And that is, of course, what the Sith wanted. The project was ordered by Jedi Master Sivodius, funded by the Sith lobbying group Damask Holdings. When the Kaminoans landed this contract, they didn't put out a press release bragging about the large amount of money that was coming to their planets. And that's because they would never publicly trade their cloning facilities. They would also never brag to the industry. It just wasn't their way of doing things. Kaminoans did not like to show outward signs of exuberance or any personality, as a matter of fact. And that's because they are, again, fully invested in their work. Anything that will take them away from it is a distraction. Because the Kaminoans were able to save themselves with science, their culture also began to view science as the most important and respected field in industry. Every culture, every people, every nation uh, has a few specific industries and professions that it values over others. For instance, Taiwan is known for um, its semiconductor manufacturing, and so for that very small country, that one industry is incredibly important. Through history, there have also been civilizations centered around religion or agriculture, civilizations centered around trade, commerce, even civilizations that are centered around militarism or energy extraction. For the Kaminoans, it was all about scientific research. It was desirable to be a scientist, to enter the field of cloning research and achieve greatness for yourself and the Kaminoan people. And so it was only natural for the scientific fields to attract the best Kaminoans. And Kaminoan society's very crystal clear focus on the sciences is kind of what makes their cloners the best in the galaxy. On top of that, the secretive nature of the cloning project meant that there was very little oversight for the entire program after the initial order. I mean, you guys remember what happened when Obi-Wan Kenobi arrived on Kamino after after all those years. The Prime Minister is expecting you. I'm expected? And I can't really stress how weird the situation is. Sifo ordered the clone army in 33 BPY, 
a project that I'm imagining costs hundreds of billions, if not trillions of credits. And the Kaminoans don't hear from the Republic or the Jedi until 11 years later, and they're all like, oh, hey, you made it back, nice to see you. It seems like in this last decade of producing this clone army, the Kaminoans neither visited nor tried to communicate with Coruscant at all about this project. They didn't ask about what the clients wanted, they didn't show their clients any you know, progress. Um, we're not even sure if Cypher Davis has paid a down payment or he made the payment in full. The fact that they didn't attempt to communicate to the Republic and didn't hear from them for a decade, but still continued working on this project says a lot about these aliens. This actually makes no financial sense. They took a huge risk here. And so you also get the sense that the Kaminoans are not just doing these projects for money and prestige. It's almost as if the enjoyment of scientific study and research alone was enough to sustain their work ethic. And remember that arrogance we talked about before. I think there's also a part of the Kaminoans that enjoyed not having some outsider micromanage them. And so this lack of communication between the client and the business is something that mutually benefits both parties, I guess. Now, prior to the project with the clone army, the Kaminoans had very little experience with the human anatomy. This is very apparent in the fifth of the phase one clone trooper armor. It was clearly made by someone who had no understanding of how the human body moved and what was comfortable or not. But that does not mean that the interest was not there. Individuals like Nala Se and Ko Sai were at the forefront of cloning technology and genetic research at Kamino, and both individuals were key to the clone trooper project. Both also worked on their own personal and more advanced scientific research, as was you know, encouraged by Kamino in society. Ko Sai was extremely ruthless and saw the clones as her products and demanded perfection for them, but she was also really interested in obtaining blood and tissue samples from Force sensitives because she desired to clone these traits. Now again, Ko Sai plays a smaller role and, and Nala Se more or less replaces her as the chief medical scientist at Typica City. Nala Se seems to have a genuine interest in pushing the limits of genetic mutations in the FET clones. This is essentially what Clone Force 99 is. Nala Se is also responsible for creating Omega. Now, some Star Wars fans have pointed out that you can't really clone a female from a male donor, but that's not exactly how cloning works. Sex is determined by your chromosomes. Males have an X and a Y, whereas female has double Xs. In order to create a female clone from a male donor, you would have to take two samples of the X chromosome from the male and insert it into the egg that you're going to clone. What's more difficult is cloning a male from a female because females don't have any Y chromosome that you would need to insert. Now it's very clear in all the Star Wars lore that cloning a force sensitive individual does not necessarily guarantee that you will have a force sensitive clone. Darth Vader for instance cloned Galen Merrick thousands of times before subject 1138 was successful. Star Wars really loves calling back that number, huh? And we see on Mount Tantus that no matter which clone's blood they try, they can't really figure out how to pass on force sensitivity to a cloned embryo, until they get their hands on Omega's blood, that is. The clone sample supported a positive M count transfer with no degradation from the specimen. So what does all of this mumbo jumbo mean? Well, the reason why we don't allow the cloning of human beings here on Earth is because of the inherent risk associated with the technology. Whenever the cloning process is attempted with sheep or dogs or other animals, there are also unexpected mutations that can occur that can be unpredictable and potentially fatal. I'm guessing one of the mutations that happens with the Emperor's clones is that they're unable to replicate the force sensitivity of the hosts, and that eventually leads to the body being diseased and unsatisfactory. I believe what Nala Se is trying to do here with her research is actually very similar to CRISPR. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. It actually refers to a type of bacteria in the immune system that can be used to basically cut and edit our genes, our DNA, it's kind of crazy. And because our genes control every aspect of who we are, our hair color, our likelihood of getting certain diseases, and most certainly midichlorian counts and force sensitivity, CRISPR is definitely one way you could customize a clone any way you want. I'm guessing Nala say use CRISPR to create the Bad Batch. She might have also altered Omega somehow after cloning a female version of her. And the fact that Nala say wants to hide Omega from the very beginning of the Bad Batch before she even realizes what Emperor Palpatine wants makes me think that she actually managed to somehow isolate the gene that actually controls the midichlorian counts, which of course would make Omega's blood extremely valuable indeed. It is also possible that Nala Se isolated this genetic marker and only found it in the female genome, which would mean that M counts can only be passed from uh, mother to offspring rather than father to offspring. That's kind of a wild theory. I don't have too much proof that that's 
That's a thing. You know that some people say that the average male human's DNA is closer to that of a chimpanzee than that of a woman? And out of the 20,000 genes we have in our body, 6,500 of them are expressed differently in a man and a woman. It's very possible that this difference between the female and male genome is why we see the Kaminoans cloning females. Then we have Emery Carr. She most likely tested her own blood as well, but it clearly does not have the same effect as Omega. But Emery Carr is different from Omega. For one, she's an adult, which seems to indicate that she is advanced aging like the rest of the clone troopers. Which also makes me think that like the clones, she was made for some commercial purpose where time of production is extremely important. The fact that she is a female might indicate that she was created for a job where females are more preferred or just better at that task. It could be something as simple as working as a nurse in the Republic's military facilities, or maybe some more meticulous work as a lab researcher. It should also be noted that Emery Carr as a last name, something we don't see many other clones have. Furthermore, she never identifies herself by a number, and so I think it's possible that Emery Carr was some type of service clone that was given to a wealthy individual who then gave her their family name. Kind of like how slave owners would give their slaves their own family name as well. Either way, it's clear that Dr. Royce Hemlock pulled her away from her previous job, and she is very grateful for this. Now, there is another strange possibility why the Kaminoans are creating female clones. Remember how I talked about um, the possibility of creating a female clone from a male donor? Well, for any cloning to happen, that genetic material still needs to be placed inside of a donor egg. That's what we talked about before. I'm not really sure where the Kaminoans are getting these donor eggs. It is possible that in the Star Wars galaxy they have figured out a way to create artificial human eggs, but I'm guessing because the Kaminoans are not used to working with humans, that is out of the question. And so a physical donor needs to provide eggs, especially for that first batch of clones. However, it was possible that one of the first steps that the Kaminoans made was cloning a few female fets like Emery Carr and then harvesting their eggs for all future clones in the project. Anyway, those are just some of my theories on why the Kaminoans would create female fet clones. Let me know in the comment section below what you guys think because I, I think this is going to be a harder question to answer. So let's see what the community thinks. Anyway, thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy. See you later.